It's time for Type 40, your Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hartley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks, designated driver, mouth runner, and flying solo on this edition of the show. Or am I? As always, we'll deliver Doctor Who conversation, facts, views, banter, and whatever else if you stay with me, and it'll all be fit for the 60th anniversary year here on our free speaking big thinking eclectic show for everyone whatever decade or century you started watching reading or listening along to those ongoing adventures of our hero doctor who we chat about it all on this show there may even be a few laughs thrown in along the way so come and step into our tardis and share this journey together here with us on type 40. yes uh, here we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of the show our favorite tv series doctor who's a show that uh, crosses so many boundaries at its best it brings people together all in the spirit of of adventure really doesn't it and of the shared viewing experience and here for the next hour or so with me you'll get to do that as i take a connecting call with two fellow fans podcasters and creatives from the other side sides of the world when i fling back the lever on on this console marked wibbly wobbly timey wimey now, when i say marks it's in kyle wagner's handwriting i'm convinced this so if it all goes wrong <laughs> then i know exactly who to blame if i end up on the uh, basket weavers podcast or something like that he's getting all the blame for that one okay what's <laughs> What's next time? We'll tell. Okay, so in the meantime, if you want to do some real-time travelling of your own, each and every edition of this show, past, present, and future, is just a tap or two away if you know where to look. Previews, interviews, geek outs, and deep dives with all our regular panellists and some pretty awesome guests. We know there's something for every fan over at type40.podbean.com. More about that a little later on as well as a couple of minutes where we will make contact with the matrix of all knowledge that we call the fandom podcast network for a word about all the other cool conversations going on across the family of podcasts over there okay i think i'm as ready as i'll ever be the hands are off because i'm certain this will be a very friendly action displacement let's go meet the guests where are we this time who are we speaking to i'm not going to leave you waiting for that for too long but this is where we we scroll the universe checking the fixed points and the not so much both off or on screen and this time i'm traversing the time zones it's quite early for me uh, heaven knows when where it is for them. We're going to find out now as I'm joined by Lucia and Talia. They're from the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast. I think I've got that in the right order. Welcome to the show, both. <laughs> hello. 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 So I think the first question, the most important question, we're going to start with a really deep and serious question, Talia, is are you, are either of you uh, Lego fans? <laughs> <laughs> Because this this TARDIS, believe it or not, you may laugh, Lucia, but this TARDIS is made entirely out of Lego bricks. Oh wow! It looks gorgeous, and I can see a little bit of I can see a little bit of like they must be small Lego bricks because I can see like a little bit of the detailing. I was like, it looks a little ripply in a way that doesn't look like wood. Yeah, it's yeah, slightly uncanny, isn't it? And it's full size. It's not. It's not in camera trickery either. That is a full size TARDIS. There. Can, would you like to guess, Talia, how many bricks were used to create this? Down to the. I'll give you to the nearest ten thousand. <laughs> um, I would guess um, mm. one hundred and twenty thousand bricks. How about you, Lucia? I was going to go 200 and something, 200,000 something. Oh, Talia, you win. Yeah, it's just oh. over 100,000 bricks. It's, that's, in, that's okay. You, <laughs> maybe you know your Lego. I think everybody yeah. loves Lego though, don't they, Lucia? Yeah, I mean, I was about to say, I was very pleased to see um, something based in Australia because there is quite a large Lego community here. I remember only... Still really? Yeah, no, only yeah. a couple of years ago, I went to go and see um a lego exhibit over at um my local gallery the victoria um 
arts gallery and it was incredible. Um, I, I personally haven't played with it or like done any sort of wild, incredible yeah. sculpture with it um, since yeah. I was a tiny, tiny tot. But um, I do appreciate the artsmanship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one was uh, on Bondi Pavilion in Bondi Beach. Mm. I don't think it's there anymore. I think they sort of move it around a little. It was an arts installation that was that was put in place there, and it was yeah, it was full size. I don't think the doors open though, Talia. But you can't have everything, can you? No, you can't have everything. <laughs> but I I will say I do love Legos. Um, I, I I had a lot of Lego sets that I would sometimes build when I was younger, up until I was yeah. in high school, and then. I was in, and then I was in college and then I like moved into my own apartment and then it was like, I just didn't have as much time for Legos, but luckily I have a lot of younger cousins who are <laughs> like from like, some of them are like, I think my cousin close to me in age is only two years younger than me. But then on like my other side of my family, I have a cousin who's eight years younger than me. And then it's just, it then it just goes like younger and younger. <laughs> so like oh, I have so some cousins where I'm old enough to be their well. parent. <laughs> that must be and, that must be nice yeah no it's like because i'm always hanging out with um with kids and so i do like sometimes play legos with them and then also my favorite um my favorite thing to do because i don't like to wish ill on people but if no. someone like really pisses me off i'm like like i hope that they step on a lot <laughs> of legos i was like i was like <laughs> That's oh. what I'm manifesting. It's like, oh, that person, that person's really annoying. That person did something that really, <laughs> like, that really, uh, that really, oh. like, pissed me off. I'm gonna, I'm going to, I'm gonna mm. uh, manifest that they step smite, on a lot of smite. Legos. And she, she's got such a kind face as well, Lucia. Isn't she? You'd never, you'd never think you'd, it. You'd yeah, never you'd guess. Need, <laughs> you'd, you'd need a bloody big foot to step on, <laughs> to step on mm, this bit of Lego. Yeah, you, you yeah. would. <laughs> Good stuff. Yes. So uh, you are both uh, assigned to us this time from uh, from your own podcast, aren't you? This is the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast, and uh, yeah. you you've been putting this out for a couple of years now. Yeah, since May twenty twenty one. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But of course, as people might be able to tell from your accents, you're from very different places. We the, are from very globe. different places. And oh, we've never said, met in person. Um, oh, yeah. Right. No, so we've you... never met in person. <laughs> we've had so how did this come about? To, and we've had the this... opportunity to. It's funny. We were at the same convention in Boston in, the, in October 2019, and we when didn't we... meet each other. Yeah. <laughs> so Which is coincidentally. We, yeah. So we actually met through um a server known as the uh Black, Black Nerds Girls Create. Create. Black, Nerds, Black Create Nerds Create, Create now. <laughs> awesome. It was um, Black Girls Create, it is now Black Nerds Create. Um <laughs> so that uh that was started by the wonderful Robin and Bayana. And uh was originally started uh their original endeavor was a um harry potter podcast where they mm. both went through um called uh gosh it's been such a long time <laughs> since i've listened to harry potter stuff yeah well um, so the thing is, hashtag the podcast, wizard team. yeah so it's hashtag wizard team is the podcast and it's actually no longer a harry potter podcast um they are now putting out episodes again but because uh we don't really uh, none of us really like Harry Potter anymore. Um, so you we... broadened it to include include <laughs> real world wizardry? Do you actually practice no. it? Um, oh. It's a reread podcast, and currently they're reading Amari and the Night Brother. So right now they're uh. so they've basically shifted focus to focus on um, uh, on it's a black magical podcast now. So now they focus on uh, works on like fantasy books and works written by black authors. Oh, oh, I, oh, I, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I thought I'd found found a podcast that was going to teach me maybe my lifelong ambition to be a genuine wizard might have been, <laughs> but no, I have, to keep, I have to keep looking, keep scrolling. Uh, I choose. No, I mean, That's if, you, if you want if you want it, a... it'll, it'll be out there. It'll be out there. Keep looking there. <laughs> yeah, there are actually <laughs> lots of lots of witchcraft and paganism podcasts, though. I really mm. like three pagans and a cat. <laughs> yeah. You've never met physically, but nevertheless, you've been united by by podcasting. So you you met remotely through through this server, 
Mm-hmm. Whose idea was it? Put your hand up. Whose idea was it to to podcast? Because not everybody feels motivated, compelled to do this, do they, Lucia? Well, yeah. So I actually have another podcast. It's currently on hiatus. It's called Into the Archives. It's a fan fiction podcast. And um, when I was recording that podcast, a lot of the people that I had on the podcast were all people that I'd met through Black Nerds Create. Mm. Um, and so when I was like thinking of people to have on the podcast, because when you're in the server, there's like a bunch of different channels about a bunch of different, um, bunch of different nerdy topics. And I noticed that Lucia and I were in a lot of the same channels, talked about a lot of the same things. And we both really like um, uh, fan fiction and fan creation is something that we're both really passionate about. So then I was saying, um, and so we ended up moving from like the general channels to like sending each other DMs in the server. Um, and then we were both like, I was like, oh, I'm planning on starting this, um, fan fiction podcast, but I've also always really wanted to do a Doctor Who podcast. And then Lucia was like, well, I used to have a Doctor Who podcast, um, but then I no longer, like, work with that it, it, it fell through over um i had a doctor who podcast which was this it's the, it was the yeah. same one it's the um, same title the, oh the, this this is actually a massive rebranding uh, this is a this is a Talia. reboot <laughs> yeah version um, 2.0 oh, yeah so i initially did about three or four episodes with a uni friend um, which had the same kind of basic concept in that it was a rewatch podcast. We would like watch an episode, talk about it, send it out. Um, mm-hmm. But it never really got off the ground. And then, you know, we were only really uni friends. We kind of didn't have a lot in common. We fell out a bit and it, the podcast fall, fell apart. Neither of us were... Podcasters falling out. We never, we never fall out, do we? I'm type 40 <laughs> So yeah. it sort of lay dormant for two or three years. And then, yeah, um, yeah Talia and, then, and I got together. Um, well, what happened? And, yeah, what happened was yeah. Lucia guested on the on the fan fiction podcast. And then we had such good chemistry that after we stopped recording, we kept talking for like ages. And then we're like, I've always wanted to start a Doctor Who podcast. You have a Doctor Who podcast that's in need of rebooting. Let's yeah. just do this. And Reboot. so that was in March of 2021. Yeah. Um, so this is a story that I right? hear variations of quite a lot, that creativity bonds people and then they find the outlet that they can channel together, that all that energy, is that, am I close to how it was, the, the connection between you? Yeah, well, I mean, the funny thing is we we decided to start this podcast together and we just sort of like jumped in feet first we barely knew each other we barely knew how to podcast um and so our early episodes are like not as good as not good not good please don't listen to our early episodes i i yeah i recommend i recommend if you start listening to our podcast actually our bonus episodes i feel like we started those in fall 2021 when we actually knew a bit more because we because we were rewatch podcasts we're rewatching from Christopher Eccleston from 2009, 2005, no, 2009, 2005, um, through the, until, basically until we get caught up, and then we're also going to be doing bonus episodes, um, uh, about episodes as they come out, um, and then, like, hopefully we're also going to dive into some old Who as well, um oh we respect this we approve this message yeah (laughs) um and i occasionally actually because i haven't seen um as much old who as i would like um so So much of it though isn't natalia oh so what i what i've been doing is um is occasionally when i'm uh because usually i i don't watch all the episodes at once but if i have because like the because this because the stories are so um and because the stories are like longer yeah, blocks in, of episodes. In, yeah. But occasionally when I do have like six hours to set aside to watch a serialized <laughs> episode, um in my copious amounts of free time, I'll actually live tweet it. Oh um, I see. And do like a little reaction being like, what is going on here? Hmm. Uh, and well, when you do that though, when you put that out. Obviously, because particularly on somewhere like Twitter, you're going to get a response from people who know those episodes inside out. And and um, I think 
for people on that side of the equation, there's a fascination there with people's first reactions. That's why reaction mm -hmm. videos do so well on YouTube, isn't it, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So how do you um, select your episodes, Lucia? Is it, are you working your way through a particular season or do you, do you pick them at, ran at random? Oh, we're going chronological. We're going so, chronologically, aside so, from bonus episodes of episodes as they come out. Yeah, yeah. so oh, we see. started yeah. uh, with season one of the reboot and have just been methodically making our way through. Um, and then as new episodes come out, sort of get on people's feeds and be like, hi, we're here. <laughs> um, <laughs> hello. We'll also live tweet new episodes co-currently with, as they're coming out on BBC America. Um, which is yeah. annoying because I swear the ads on BBC America will be my villain origin story. <laughs> Kyle <laughs> Wagner, if you're listening, you've got a, yeah. <laughs> a fellow, uh, yeah, a fellow for the cause here. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, it's something we do here quite a lot. Uh, the the pair of the Doctor special that ninety minutes mm -hmm. for us was over two hours for people watching on BBC America. I'm told by Kyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, and also sometimes they'll like cut stuff out. <laughs> yeah, so that's been also a huge thing is to sort of bring it around to a hot topic at the moment. That's that's never going to go uh, down well, is it? <laughs> is um, I have very often offered my ABC iView uh, connection to Talia <laughs> because um, at the at at the time. We had full access to a lot of BBC products, including Doctor Who, without any ads, without any cutting, without exactly, yep, that's the one, um, you know, direct direct from the source, um, which that relationship What are friends sadly, for, Lucia? What are friends for? Yeah, and now that's all at an end, which is incredibly... Yeah. Uh, all all change isn't it quite exciting in a lot of respects i think we're all pretty excited well i i know for a fact that uh, that one one guy in particular is very excited that's that's mr mr shooty gatwai i think you can, you can't keep the smile mm -hmm. off his face and uh, yeah i i just think that guy is uh, yeah a real breath of fresh air uh, same oh, billy gibson come to think of it i'm so excited i've actually already been putting together my 15th doctor cosplay even though he's not coming out until like 2024, <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing this. I have like, um, I literally, I have, so I had some pants and a jacket that I liked, but then I recently got new pants that I actually like even more, but they don't actually go with the jacket. So now I need a different jacket. So I guess now I'm going to have like two alts of the, <laughs> the mm. outfit. That's yeah. it. Um, get, uh, get kitted out with the yeah. whole thing shooting. Yeah, I'm very oh, excited because yeah. I watched him in Sex Education, and he was, um, and he's in his character Eric F. Young, one of my favorite characters in Sex Education. And I feel like the Doctor is going to be a very different character because Eric is like a teenager, <laughs> not, well, yeah, a, this is the not thing. a time I saw, lord. I, but I saw this a quote from really exciting. I saw a quote from Shooty quite recently where he said he's going from playing a teenager to to playing somebody who is pretty much ageless because he's 30 mm -hmm. years years of age himself so he's definitely not a teenager and i, I mm -hmm. just find this about fascinating and i'm at, at, a, at quite a particular place with this because i have never seen this man properly act i've the only thing i've seen him in is an ad for a console game a formula one console game where he plays a racing car driver a kind of lewis hamilton kind of figure and it's very um and it's all sort of charged and it's very playful and mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, machismo, I think, involved in that. Whereas I know that his role in sex education is everything but that. And so that, to me, points to an actor with immense uh, range, which is mm -hmm. so exciting for the show. And I'm tempted yeah. to go and watch sex education. But, I will uh, say sex education is very explicit. That's why yeah. all the teenagers are played by adults. <laughs> um, because um, sometimes when you're watching, like I would not watch sex education with my mother, for example. Um, because <laughs> sometimes when I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, am I watching a TV show or am I mm. watching like an adult movie? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very much getting into that bracket now, Talia. I'm aware that I'm becoming a sort of podcast dad figure. So yeah, you guys, <laughs> you're concerned for my moral well-being. But, but what it is, I feel the same way about him. Because I, I was so excited like 12 years ago. Was it 12? 13? 
13, 12 years ago, 13 years ago when Matt Smith was cast, because I'd mm. never consciously seen Matt Smith in anything and he was a blank canvas. And mm. and so for me, he was, he wasn't, a, this sounds a bit dehumanizing for Matt Smith, but he was the doctor instantly. And so I feel that if I see Shooty in anything else, in all seriousness, whatever he's playing, it may impact on my perception of him as the doctor. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm at that place, shall I binge watch everything he's ever done or stay completely fresh and just see him as the doctor? Because I, I, I really do feel that this could make, I, I mean, he's got 2 million followers on Instagram. He's already a star, some would argue, but mm -hmm. he's, not a, he's not a name, he's not a household name, certainly not in Britain. And this it's he's on his way there already you know people are aware that he's that he's on the way and it's yeah, it's yeah. really really I mean, exciting playing stuff. The will certainly give him a bit of a boost yeah <laughs> i will say that there is no way that i'm not going to watch the barbie movie because i'm very excited about it <laughs> <laughs> well that looks a lot of fun though doesn't it it looks like he's having fun it looks like everybody involved in that thing is having fun in it yeah i know <laughs> like it, it like that movie looks like such a romp and like I feel like it's the kind of movie where, like, even if it ends up being bad, it's going to be end up being bad in a good way. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> I do. This could very well be Shooty's year. It, it's certainly Doctor <laughs> Who's year, 60th anniversary year. And mm. obviously, it's all changed already. We've, we've had two new logos, variations on one logo, in a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. And here in Britain, you know, it's, it's um, gradually bringing about a, a real... Uh, reinvigoration of the of the fan base how much do these occasions translate overseas do you think is it something that we're all feeling the fact that we're in a, a, another momentous anniversary year because to me i've got to be honest the 50th anniversary doesn't seem that long ago but mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I, well, I do when the 50th i do anniversary joke. happened i was still in high school okay yeah oh, no oh, that was my so, i remember hang on, i'm gonna need a, i'm gonna need a minute i'm gonna <laughs> Back in a sec. Okay. <laughs> yeah. there. Well, I I distinctly remember the fiftieth anniversary because I remember um, watching it. It was the year I graduated high school, so it was um, so. But we all went up to. Mm. We have. Um, I'm sure there are equi equivalents in america and britain but our sort of end of high school celebration is referred to as schoolies um and we all as went what, up with what was that sorry as schoolies so s-c-h-o-o-l-i-e-s -E i've not heard that we're one big, before yeah we're a big fan of slang here <laughs> oh, i know that we've got matt pot from tasmania who's a regular on the show he comes out with all sorts like yeah. Well, it's, okay, it's always so, very fun listening. It's always very fun talking with uh, foreign folk because I'll say yeah. something and think it's completely innocuous, just a part of my everyday speech. I don't yeah. think of myself as someone who says a lot of slang. Um, well, even just the way you pronounced people. H is different from the way I pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll be I brought up by it. people being like, what was that word? Did you repeat that for me again? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but I remember going up with all of my friends uh, up to uh, a friend's beach house for schoolies. And we all were all bunking together watching the 50th. And also um, uh, an adventure in space and time, which had a very close... Um, very close to my heart but yeah class but no to think class that's act. 10 years ago is not fun for me <laughs> so speaking, of, speaking about the the international divide how do you find recording together it, is it challenging or have you got it down to a fine art now after the last 18 months two years i feel like we've got it pretty down at this point uh i feel like i've got it i feel like we're definitely at a point where um we're much more uh we're much more in sync I feel like yeah <laughs> scheduled like we we've got a much better routine a um, well routine, machine yeah and our routine does include me waking up at 4 30 in the morning every friday <laughs> this time of year so that's the this other thing is this time of year because um sometimes we are right now we're 16 hours apart but sometimes we're 15 or 14 
Mm. Um, and also, it wasn't always Talia getting up super early. There was a long period when we were first started yeah. when it was me getting up. So uh, we yeah, do share well, the you responsibility. weren't getting up super <laughs> early. You were getting up at like 8 o'clock. I'm getting up at 4.30. I was getting up at like 6 a.m. Okay, oh, still not 4.30. I Don't shouldn't laugh. Petty, I shouldn't was... laugh, but, but <laughs> I, I can't. I can't quite help myself. Um, but th in all seriousness, though, this is this show. It's one of lots of things. There are lots of shows and movies and and hobbies that bond people together. But this really does bond people together like that. And mm -hmm. and obviously, your friendship and and the the thing that you have built together. It's important to you, and mm -hmm. the, the commitment between you. It's sort of an unwritten thing. It's an unspoken thing, isn't it? It's an understanding that if you want to spend time together and explore this topic that brought you together in the first place, then mm -hmm. you know if you've got to get up a little early or, or stay up a little later. It's um, it's it's funny, isn't it? How when we really want to do something or want to speak to somebody, we will we will go that extra mile or two. Oh yeah, no. We also like will FaceTime in what is for me the evening and what is for lucia her lunch break <laughs> yeah we've had a lot of uh lunch break conversations and... <laughs> um, good stuff yeah and and also um we like sent each other like p care packages for the holidays which was um, yeah, I, really like, I, I, I really thanks like. I really like. Thanks to you Australian me. customs, it literally only just arrived for Talia. <laughs> and Lucia got hers by Christmas, but I had to send it in like October <laughs> to get it. There. But we managed. Well, speaking about uh, about the challenges of being international. Doctor Who fans. I think that brings me to uh, something I wanted to, to talk to you about because as international fans, obviously, it's all changed for this series for the both of you in a way that it isn't going to be for, for myself and people people in Britain because for the, for the anniversary uh, going forward, we've had the news that uh, the Disney Plus is going to be the official sole home for new episodes of Doctor Who from November. So not just the stuff with David Tennant coming back, but all the shooty Gatwa stuff too moving on on from there so i want to start with you lucia really because as an australian i would imagine this is going to affect you more so doctor who's i think arguably doctor who's second home is australia yeah. and the abc brand in itself is pretty synonymous with doctor who isn't it yeah absolutely um it it was a massive shock to the system not just to me but um to the whole sort of australian doctor who fandom and community um it was it's very hard not to see it as a kick in the teeth um that's what matt said been, yeah yeah it's just there's been such a long relationship between the abc and the bbc and in particular with doctor who there's a lot of um a lot of Australian, a lot of uh, the ABC's programming is sort of geared towards promoting a lot of uh, BBC content and Doctor Who is a huge flagship in that sense. Um, like um, in a very sort of like materialistic marketing kind yeah. of sense of it all, just in the simple sort of like talking about like, money like when you go into an abc shop for instance like a brick and mortar shop there is always an entire section devoted to doctor who and that's all it is the t-shirts like, the mugs all that sort of thing and there was a spin-off show for a while wasn't that called whovians presented by Rose, yeah what's his name oh i can't remember myself, I, I know i know the guy yeah. he's a very, <laughs> very likable bloke but i've forgotten his name already shows how fickle we <laughs> we really are doesn't it yeah, but yeah, no, there's a huge, there's a huge community here in Australia of Whovians that was, I would, I feel very comfortable saying is built on the fact that the programming is free and it's accessible mm. um, and that there was always a really strong base for it as well. Like it wasn't just the new stuff coming out. It was, we had a lot of access to old Who, we had a lot of access to all of the revival stuff. Um, you had the repeats that we never got. I, can't, I constantly yeah. get reminded about this as well. You know, before you were born, yeah. people of my generation would, could see Doctor Who every single day. And, and I suppose that's part of, it's kind of like, kind of like how we got neighbors here that's on every, 
it was on yeah. every day here. We got the, 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 the thing sort of reversed, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, this is something that I've heard quite a lot over the last few months. It was a, sh a shock to the system, definitely. Mm. But generally speaking, it's been a few months on from that. How, how do you feel about it now? A, a little more? Yeah, it's still great. <laughs> still I mean, hurt. it's still it not great. I'm still not happy that it's happened. Um, no. Because like you say, there's a paywall there that, what, yeah. that has never been there before, isn't there? Exactly, yeah. Um, I, I can, like, see from, like, an outside perspective, like a, a more sort of objective perspective, that this is a very smart move and um, uh, in, a, in a much broader sense does both open up Doctor Who to a whole new market while still closing off, a, like by making Disney Plus the exclusive uh, distributor of the new show, that necessarily limits it to only countries and areas that have access to Disney Plus, um, yeah. which is certainly a move, right? Because um, we forget, don't we? I think once we've had a streaming platform launch in our territory, Talia, we forget that others, that the rollouts tend to happen gradually, don't they? And that others may be behind in the same position that we were before. And I, I suppose once we're on the other side of that equation, it's slightly different. But obviously, you're you're in America. Which part of America are you in, Talia? I'm on the um, East Coast. So I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which um, is actually really funny um, because there's there's a Cambridge in um, the UK, but there's also... So I work for an organization that has Cambridge in the name, and we are often um, confused with other Cambridges in the UK and around the US. There's like a lot of places called Cambridge. So like... It's really funny. Like sometimes we'll get an email, and we're like, "Nope, you mean the, <laughs> you mean you mean the Cambridge guy. in like, <laughs> like it's like, no, you're looking for some place that's in Canada, or like you're looking for some place that's in the U.S. or in the U.K." Um, but no, so I live um, in Cambridge, is um, right next to Boston, um, but it's also um, a lot of people might know it because it's where Harvard and MIT are. <laughs> oh, okay. So well, Harvard well, and MIT I'm... are not in Boston, they are in Cambridge. Harvard <laughs> is a very old American institution. It's a word mm -hmm. that we associate with with America. And I think uh, probably of equal <laughs> equal amounts to the word yeah. to the word Disney. It's as an, as American as as apple pie and, and the little white picket fences and things like that. So yeah. somebody who's who's in America to see Presumably, Doctor Who is one of your favorite shows. If you do a, a podcast, oh, about. to see a brand that you show. love. Oh, it is your favorite show. Oh, it's definitely my favorite show. Like Doctor Who is like my number one show. It's been my number one. Um, it's been my number one like facet of my life, really. <laughs> like, if I have a personal brand, it's very it's much affiliated with Doctor hear. Who. I, honestly, th this never gets old. It's enchanting to hear that, not just from people in other territories in the world, but different generations too. It, it really, it really is lovely to hear. Um, the, the, yeah. the Disney brand being, being attached to it. I mean, for me, I, I, I think that there's clearly a lot of mixed feelings about this. Certainly the, mm -hmm. the listenership, the viewership that we have, I feel that, that of all the streaming platforms, Netflix, Amazon, Disney plus, and the other ones, which I can't remember the names of them, but well, I know well, there are others. Well, that's the thing is, Doctor Who has hopped. Since I started watching Doctor Who, when I first started watching Doctor Who, it was on Netflix. Then it moved to Amazon. Then it moved to HBO Max. Recently, it's been in this literally weird gone all the flux way state where it's in, where some of the episodes are on HBO Max and some of the episodes are on H AMC Plus. And I'm like, what is going on here? So, like, a while ago, when it first hopped from Amazon to HBO Max, even though my family does have an HBO Max subscription, I still went out and got all the DVDs and bought myself a DVD player. Always the safest um, option. Because I was like, I can't trust that it's not going to hop again. And you know what? I was right. Now it's going to be on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> um, <laughs> In some respects, though, I, how, here's how I feel as, as a Brit, is that if 
of all those brands, if anything, Doctor Who is, it's not a kid's show. It's specifically a family a family show. Certainly here in Britain. I think it's the same in Australia, isn't it, Lucia? A, mm, a big family yeah. brand. And yeah. to me, of all those streaming platforms here in the 21st century, Disney, you can't get more family than Disney traditionally. And so this seems like the most natural fit. If it's going to be in one, on one of the streaming platforms, I think this is the one that I'd rather it be on, Talia. Yeah, and I will say that Old Who has been on BritBox. Um, mm. So um, I've had to also get BritBox so that I could watch the episodes of Old Who. Um, but also I have a, uh, I have a Roku smart TV and there is a um, Roku, Roku has like a few like channels that are, yeah. um, that you can just watch even without a sub subscription as long as you have oh, Roku Oh, we've got TV. something similar to that, to that here, yeah. There is a channel that just plays do old Doctor Who episodes on loop 24 yeah. hours a day. It's just the Doctor Who channel. We have so one here in Britain and its yeah. name escapes me at the moment, but yes, I, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. There's so ne never I been have... more places. Never been more places that you can watch not just not just uh, classic Doctor Who, but new Doctor Who. It's fair yeah. to say that some people are uncomfortable with with the Disney brand being associated with Doctor Who. They're worried that, it, uh, that Disney could encroach on on it editorially and on it creatively. I mean, my view is that worry about it when it happens and and to just take people at face value could be the way forward. The Disney brand, I, I think, obviously, as it's expanded and as they've they've bought uh, the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, mm -hmm. Lucasfilm, all that, they've sort of expanded in in ways that would have mm -hmm. been, been unthinkable ten or fifteen years ago. And I can see that what, that could make people feel uncomfortable that, that mm -hmm. there are fewer options and that, that fewer fewer people uh, in in creative control of, of more things. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a real danger in, in entertainment, generally speaking? You know, this is your favourite show, Talia. Do you think there's a, a real danger in all entertainment, all geeky entertainment, becoming kind of homogenised like that? I do think it's actually... So on the one hand, I think that one company having a monopoly is a bit dangerous. On the other hand, my second... Oh, my boring second, as well. Yeah, yeah, but my second fandom that I'm most affiliated with is the MCU. So having to only have one subscription to watch all of Doctor Who and all of MCU, and I only have to have one app, especially yeah. because um, because the way that everything is like bundled these days, I actually get Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus as part of my phone package. So just by paying for my cell phone, I also get Disney Plus. <laughs> Yeah. So I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of fear mongering, honestly. Um being a distributor is not the same as having editorial control. I, I <laughs> um, so um that's one thing to consider. Uh I personally would not be a fan if like of the MCU route for Doctor Who. I think there's been a lot of attempts to spin it off or make it into a larger universe and obviously there's like the comics the books sarah jane adventures k9 which was a short-lived but beloved offshoot that was based right here in oz <laughs> like, um... Paul, a friend of the show paul tams who was the producer and writer on on that show we had we had paul and bob baker on the show they were the yeah. masterminds behind k9 the series you got another fan here paul another fan yeah, no, I loved K9 as a kid. It was great. Um, it was great just because um, it fed into one of my personal things, which is that not a lot of stuff is based in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. So it was really all like um, out of Australian made content. Mm. Australia's um, Australian actors, Australian technicians. Mm. Well, we were oh, talking oh, about the Barbie movie earlier, Margot Robbie, right? Like, very often Australian actors, in order to get work outside of Australia, have to change their accents, change their presentation, not mm -hmm. be Australian. And it's so it's a it's a personal grievance for me. But whenever I see yeah. Australia being celebrated in foreign media, it's always been exciting. 
exciting. I mean, Brits have the yeah. same, but nowhere near to the extent that Aussies do. I mean, Hugh, Hugh Laurie, obviously, he's the, uh, the the biggest example I can think of all those years on house. Nobody realised that he wasn't American for a long, long time. I mean, we knew in Britain because he'd been on British yeah. television for 30 years at that point. But I think the Aussies, yeah, I think you've got it, got it worse, definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, think about the amount of Australian actors that are in the like sort of MCU everything, like Hugh Jackman, oh. Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking actually, Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston play Thor and Loki, who are course. who yeah. are siblings, but they have different accents. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought it was so funny because, like, I I talk to a lot of British people, and like I talk to Lucia, and I actually have. Uh, I actually have other Australian friends as well. Um, and it's really funny. So I could tell the difference between yeah. the way that they spoke. But a lot of people just think, oh, it's not American. It's therefore the same. <laughs> it's the um, Asgardian <laughs> accent. That's what it is. Yeah. But the um, but the funny thing is, is that um, the... Uh, so, like I said, I've always been really into the MCU, but I feel like the MCU is a very is a very unique entity that can't really be. You can't use that exact blueprint like and apply the, it to everything. Like else. you can't use the same blueprint and apply it to something else. And I also think, um, like when you think of how the different, um, like the MCU is like very expansive. But it's so expansive, and also the thing is, a lot of times when you watch, like especially with the Disney Plus shows on on um, on uh, uh, available for the MCU Disney Plus stars, yeah. a lot of them you don't even have to have the context of the other things. Like I guess WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and Loki are the shows I would say that you most need the context for like there's other... a lot of continuity in those yeah there's a lot of continuity um but i will say that shows like moon knight shows like miss marvel like Love moon knight. they like moon they knight. are like they are related and even she hulk are all related to the mcu and they incorporate other mcu characters but it they're seems also like they, they use it as a starting much... point rather than remain yeah. sort of entrenched in in what we've seen before yeah. that, that it's very good? much like helpful if you know all the lore and you're like obsessive like i am <laughs> yeah. but uh it's not necessary um, that's what i saw i mean i didn't watch it all <laughs> but I did. there's so much of it but that's what i i liked about the hawkeye show because they uh mm -hmm. particularly the the opening few episodes i i, I I say I've got my own thoughts about the Marvel series. I'm, they should be making quite so much of them. I think you can, uh, to me, it's all become diluted a little. But uh, I liked how they used that part because obviously they brought through uh, the Kate Bishop character. Mm -hmm. but because it was the sort of the uh, the student and the master kind of story, everybody can relate to that. Whether you, mm -hmm. you know, in the 80s, it was whether it's the Karate Kid, there was equivalence in the 90s, there was equivalence in the noughties. We all know the story of the of the student and the master and all that and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's a kind of an ageless story that works just as well within the MCU as it does anywhere else. But no, I haven't looked at it like that. You're right. The Karate Kid, I used to watch that with my <laughs> <laughs> Well, not, not the one with the Jackie Chan, the one with Ralph. No, Matt no, no, Pepper. no. The original. Um, oh no, no. What was it called? Um, Kung Fu. It was a TV series. And it oh, had, Kung Fu um, with David David Carradine. Yes. Or the one that. Yes. There's been three um, versions of that as well. I can't keep. It's the can't early keep one. Um, There's so many things sorry. that have been rebooted so many times, which is part of. This is part of the. It was just also part of the funny thing about. Um, and the thing that I like about Doctor Who actually is that it's so like, uh, like it's not I like. I feel like con like saying that it has continuity is a bit wrong, but I'm saying like it's all like it's all affiliated with like the the BBC for the most part. It, it does like, have a it does have a it continuity. Has, it, it has a, a much, continuity it has within a much itself more and that exter in exterior. Whereas, like, if you think about, like, the MCU and how even just the whole thing of how the rights to different Marvel characters belong to together. different companies. So, like, that's why, like, the X-Men weren't in the MCU for the longest time. That's why there's three different versions of Spider-Man. Like, 
and Universal still have the Hulk. They can't, Disney can't make solo films with the Hulk, can they? Because Universal insists mm -hmm. on retaining rights, even though they've got no intention of making a Hulk movie. I it's will seen. say that the Universal Studios in Florida Hulk ride is really fun. I remember um, my mom, uh, my mom took me and my brother when we graduated high school. Um, she took us on a vacation to Florida and we went to Universal Studios and we went um, and uh, I dragged him on that Hulk ride because for some reason the line was really short that day and I dragged him on the Hulk ride I think five times in a row and he was like if you make me go on that ride again I will throw up on you <laughs> <laughs> bringing the fantastical into the into the everyday yes yeah, so yeah. it's going to be all, all change for Doctor Who if you live in other territories I think for us in Britain it's still going to have that continuity it's still going to be beyond BBC One Although the BBC itself is is changing, it's still going to be exactly where people have always found it. And, um, you know, so whilst that does, that's reassuring for Brits, we do, we feel your pain, Lucia. I, I think a lot of us do understand and we can relate in the, in the global, the, the age of global, of global television and global brands and streaming platforms, we've all been, we've all been a bit pissed off. We've all been shafted by, by one thing or another. We've all had to go and get a subscription for something else where, where we thought we'd got it covered, Talia, just as you described there. So I think these are, I know they're 21st century problems and very sort of first world problems, but still, you know, it makes yeah. you gnash your teeth now and again. I'm sure that in three or four years time, when, and I'm, I'm convinced this will be a success, and that, that uh, Bad Wolf and Sony and Disney Plus are, are doing with Doctor Who with, with Shoot to Get. I, I'm convinced they will find their audience and, th and this will grow mm -hmm. and we will see this big resurgence of Doctor Who again. I, I think it's absolutely possible that this could happen. But in three or four years' time, these conversations that we're having will, could, could feel quite quaint and it, mm -hmm. it will maybe feel like second nature that, that Disney Plus is the place that people go to and and maybe they'll pull the stuff from hbo that deal will be over by then because the, the bbc's um doctor who deal with hbo obviously part of warner's that's almost as long standing as the one with the abc they it's been connected to them through vhs releases and all sorts for a very long time but times do change and uh, yeah it's um I suppose with Doctor Who, that's the exact show that should be should be leading that ideal. I mean, it's certainly certainly in Britain, mm -hmm. when it first came back in two thousand and five, it was blazing a lot of trails. The way that Russell was thinking creatively, as you say, with all the spin offs there, Lucia. But and well, other, uh, shows, now... other shows and brands try to follow, but it never really happened, Talia. Well, sorry, it's just you made me. You just made me viscerally remember the 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 eleventh Doctor's regeneration, which causes me so much pain, because it, as part of his regeneration speech, he says, "Times must times, um, times change, and so must I. I will always remember when the Doctor was me," and that was his mm -hmm. like last words. And yeah. honestly, Matt Smith was the first Doctor that I watched live, um, and so like his regeneration like gutted me, um. And uh, I will say that um, I will say that like I, I love Capaldi. I, I love him even more than I love Matt Smith. Um, I think they're both fantastic actors, but like Capaldi's doctor is, is one that I just really adore. Um, but it's funny because like a lot of people say that, that you'll like um, like imprint on your first doctor that like the first doctor that you watch live is like your favorite doctor. Um, but I will say that that was actually not the case for me as much as I love Matt Smith. I me feel neither. Like, um, I feel like, uh, Capaldi and, and Whitaker are the doctors that I feel most connected with. Um, I also really love the fugitive doctor. I wish we saw more of her. Um, I cosplay as her sometimes, um, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, um, cosplay so too. Follow your own TikTok. Yes, I have. Yes, I have we, a we lot of <laughs> links later on. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, I have. Stuff, I, 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 I cosplay. Yeah, I cosplay as Fugitive <laughs> Doctor, as Martha, and as Bill. And then I also have, um, like I said, I'm putting together a. Uh, or I forgot if we had already started recording, but I'm putting together a fifteenth uh, Doctor cosplay. Yeah. Um, Lots of different avenues in which you can explore your creativity there. Yeah, it's a similar story with me. I mean, I, I first saw Tom Baker. Tom had been in the role for 
two or three years when I first saw the show and I stayed with it until then. But it, but I view Peter Davison as my doctor. And I think I, and, and seeing, the, seeing that doctor born on screen, mm-hmm. seeing one doctor mm-hmm. die and another one born, that gave me a sense of, um, of, of ownership. Like what was coming in was, was kind of for me, I'd mm-hmm. come into something else that was halfway, halfway through that other people had seen it all. And I wanted to see it all, but there were no repeats then. So this, this felt fresh, felt reinvigorated and felt like the Peter Davison's doctor was something like my big brother kind of character. And mm-hmm. yeah, I really, really latched onto it. And yes, it's a, yeah, I don't think, I don't think these things were set in stone as, as official uh, magazines and receive fan wisdom informs us that they are. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a curious one that, but so I think well, something it's interesting. That's... Um, I <laughs> viewed me. David Tennant as my doctor for a really long time. And it's only through this rewatch that I've found that that's not really true. Um, David Tennant's like, my least favorite of the modern. Yeah, doctors. It's, I we're, love we're David Tennant. <laughs> like I love David Tennant as an actor. And I feel like, um, I feel like he plays the role great and I feel like I also love the other stuff he's been in. And I also like, you know, from what I've seen of his like interviews and like social media and stuff, he seems like a nice guy. But his doctor, I can't handle. <laughs> he's we, get, we, we get into too much it. Yeah, no, I, I found that um, I had a whole new love for Nine for the Ninth Doctor the second time round, where I'd always kind of dismissed him earlier. Um, which is such a pity because Christopher Eccleston did so much for, mm-hmm. um, like he was he was the first Doctor of the. Revival. He did a lot of the heavy lifting for that brand mm-hmm. yeah, to bring it back. I, I don't know if this translated to Australia, Lucia, but mm-hmm. here in Britain, even by the time that Doctor Who was coming back, there was a certain amount of. It had been away for so long. A lot of people were very fond of it, but bringing mm. it back, even for them, was, oh, no, you shouldn't bring it back. I, know, I liked it then, but I wouldn't like it now. <laughs> a lot of old cheap nonsense. And and who would they get to play it? It'd be Paul Daniels. It'd be, it'd be some comedian or light entertainer. And and so Chris being aligned with that brand at that moment in it, I don't think he's an actor who could pick his jobs, Chris Eccleston, but for an actor who was taken so seriously by his peers and the British public, those who knew of him, to align himself with something such as Doctor Who for, for families, for, for children, was a, quite a gamble on, on his part. And, and um, f- when he was taking it seriously, it meant that everybody else could take it seriously. And I, I, I do, I think that, I, I see sometimes it, um, it's spoken about on social media, uh, skip nine, or don't skip nine. I think, why would you do that? Why? Don't skip nine. <laughs> that was yeah. When I was when I first started watching Doctor Who, it was um I was in high school and I had uh, I was in study hall and um with my freshman year I was in study hall and there were these older students I think they were like juniors or seniors and we were like all because study hall was in the cafeteria so like you like sat at the different cafeteria tables and ended up and they were like big tables they could seat like I think like eight or ten people. Um, but like the table I ended up sitting at was with a bunch of like nerdy, like Doctor Who people. Um, and I think there were a couple of my, there might've been like a couple of the freshmen, but like a lot of them felt like they were older than me. And they were like, you got to watch this show, Doctor Who, you'll love it. Don't skip nine. (laughs) So it is a, it is a thing then. It is a thing. Doctor Who is, uh, yeah, it, it continues. It rolls on. The cameras are rolling at the moment. They've been up and down the country. They've been mostly in Wales for a change. They've been in, <laughs> in Swansea in particular last week. They were filming with some some sort of sluggy, sluggy type creature. I don't know if you saw those pictures. They were filming at a university I did. Yeah. campus. I did see it. Yeah. And it looks, I, mean, I get the impression these these creatures are going to be augmented through, through CGI, but they're I don't know. It's all very Russell T. Davies, very colourful, a little bit Power yeah. Rangers, and I can't wait to see what that's going to yeah. look like when yeah, it's I all saw on a screen. Of, I saw a couple of photos of um, people. It looked like they were being hugged, but I'm sure they were being <laughs> <nefarious> <laughs> Something nasty is happening to them, I think, Lucia. Um, it's not going to happen. My immediate thought was like, oh. I was having a bit of a rough week, and I was like, you know what? The all encompassing hug of a giant slug creature. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I wouldn't mind it, to be honest. <laughs> well, Doctor Who, they yeah, they are filming uh, with Shooter Gatwas. Even got his own sort of custom clapperboards here, which is very, mm -hmm. very chic, very stylish. And uh, the Mirror and OK Magazine have have been all over this, and they've got some exclusive photographs from from the shoot with uh, with Millie Gibson as Ruby Sunday, and uh, and we've got Gemma Redgrave back as Kate Stewart too. So I thought to I'm round so off, excited. we could have a little look. We could have a bit of a nose, Talia, at what they've been up to here. So this is this is what's going on over. Well, I can't remember where they were. Was it? Um, where were they in the country? So yeah, unit were arriving there. We've got unit troops and and all the the artillery and vehicles and whatnot it's kind of re oddly reassuring <laughs> to see mm -hmm. the unit logo reappear isn't it yeah i will say of of ruby sunday and her and yeah. like having her as a companion i am just like i'm really tired of having companions from the 21st century or like from we hear whenever so much or like, on this show yeah or like yeah or like uh, like like seriously i really want I want more alien companions back. Like I want more, like I want to see more companions from like different eras. Like I was just saying, um, I was just having a conversation. Like I really wish that Clara as a companion had been Victorian Clara. Not going to lie. Yeah. Like, Sarah, I think that we've would got another one. Yes. Great. We, hear this. <laughs> we hear this completely. Yeah. I feel I, like yeah. that would have been like so much like, I don't know. So, like, there's there's a part of me that's really hoping that um, Ruby is like from a different planet or something. <laughs> yeah, I think she we looks like we'll she looks like she's, we, she's from a different planet. <laughs> yeah, or that we I think the Russell will go the team again to make it like like I'm sort of thinking back to I'm a bit more familiar with old who than Talia is because there's a bit more uh, support for it here so there's a lot mm -hmm. of libraries full of old DVDs and things like that but like I'm thinking back to Adric I'm thinking back to like um Romana and uh oh gosh what's his name um, people who are if they're not out of time then they're out of place when exactly. they're when they visit contemporary like, it was yeah it was much more of a sort of uh, accepted notion, the idea that the companion could be from anywhere and any when. Yeah, um, I will and I think say that... I have seen, Ro like, Romana's one of my favourite characters, so uh, I Romana have one seen... Romana 1 or Romana 2! <laughs> yeah. I like, I like, I like number, I, I, I like, um, I'm just saying that I do enjoy, like, I have seen Old Who, it's just, until I got BritBox um, a few months ago, like it was hard to find the episodes. Yeah. Like I said, there was that there's that channel where it'll play you random episodes, but um, so like I've seen like a bunch of random Doctor Who classic Who episodes, and they've been all out of order. I think the first episode I watched was um, Caves of Andrazani. Oh one. yeah, oh that's um, yeah. The a blowout episode. I was just wondering, have they, <laughs> has uh, somebody skinned Kermit alive there to make, to make uh, Kate Stewart's new coat? Oh. That way to <laughs> a little, but a little it does, worrying it, there, a little worrying. Yeah. It does look like it might look like Kate and Ruby have some kind of relationship, which would be very interesting. I think that could be fun. Um, in terms of, you know, having coffee at a cafe isn't something mm -hmm. I don't think Kate tends to usually do often with companions or without. Um, yeah, no, Kate usually she just takes the them now. to the Black Archive. Exactly. She's been on, <laughs> been on this show well over a decade now, and I always enjoy seeing Gemma Redgrave in this case. Well, most of the time I do. I mean, I, I know that in the one episode of Flux, it looked like she'd been given the script like 10 minutes before she was reading it. But every other time, Gemma Redgrave has been a consummate professional. But I do feel that the character, for what we've seen in so many episodes now, and to have such a great actress too in this role, they really should start developing the character a, a little now. I'd like to feel more of her personality come through. Because mm -hmm. she's she's got such range, Gemma Redgrave. She's very well respected yeah. in Britain, and it's it's still there's still a lot of a prestige in having yeah. her so associated with Doctor Who. So I'm, I do hope that with with scripts by Russell in particular, yeah, exactly, Gemma, exactly. She agrees. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was her Russell birthday yesterday. Christine. I'm not I sure did, when you're releasing yeah. it. I'm not sure when you're releasing this, but this will be about but, two weeks ago, about a week and a half ago. Then, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, her birthday was was uh, was on January 14th. 
Um, there you so, go. Happy birthday, Gemma. Yeah. 58 years of age. We first saw it in the um, the pair of three, believe it or not, Lucia, back in 20, that was 2011? Yes, I think so. Yes, I think. Yeah, and well, I remember there being such excitement with her being, like her character being so connected to the Brigadier and hoping that she would fulfill a similar role. Um, and of course the Brigadier is so beloved um, as a character mm -hmm. um, and well-deserved. Um, and it's just never quite reached that point. I feel like it's more yeah. sort of, she shows up is incredibly competent and fun. She and points she at things and tells off. a few people what to do and then buggers <laughs> off. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the Brigadier, it, it, there was yeah. a, a lot of banter. He was an active component of several stories. Mm. And yeah. Yeah, there are times he was belligerent and he could, but he could also be very, very open. At some times he made decisions which you would question and, and other times he, he uh, made decisions which were universally clearly the right thing to do. Whereas I, I, I do really feel now to justify Kate's continued involvement that, that, that mm. they need to develop it. The fans want to know who this woman is. And what her, I think we can probably guess what her values are, come to think of it. Mm -hmm. But I think it'd be nice to, to learn more about her as a person mm -hmm. and, um, and how, she, how she is equipped to do what she does. I mean, she's a character that originated in um, unofficial fiction in a, 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 a straight to video film called Downtime. And, um, and so she had this sort of unique path, really, to the screen. So, but yes, yeah, after 30 years, it's high time they, de they developed it. I've every faith in Russell T. Davis. If you can't have faith in the, in probably the best, certainly the best writer in British television working currently, then who can you place faith in? And I'm very excited to see this going forward. It's just nice. It's nice to see Doctor Who out filming somewhere, anywhere again, isn't it? I mean, how, how do you feel there overseas? Is it when you see Doctor Who filming in these in these locations in little towns in Britain? Does it feel like all is right with the world, Lucia? <laughs> it does a little bit, yeah. Obviously, we don't get the same sort of. It's not the same kind of excitement where we could be like, oh, if we if we grab our coats and <laughs> like, <laughs> we might be able to catch them, you know. Um, but it is um, like uh, whenever there's any kind of behind the scenes or photos or bits of footage it's always very at least for I think more personally for me as someone who's very interested in all of the behind the scenes and getting mm. as much information as I possibly can about production um it's very exciting for me um I know that's not a value that's held by everyone <laughs> and what we yeah. were talking about the ABC earlier is it not is it attractive in some respect that with Doctor Who being not just not just with Disney Plus because I don't want to do a disservice to Bad Wolf and Sony. They're international too. There's more of a likelihood now, Talia, that Doctor Who could potentially you could walk down your your street and Doctor Who may well be filming in the states or or indeed in Australia. It's more likely now that it's got these attachments to to larger brands, isn't it? You know, it's what what we may lose in in some respects, we may gain in others. Do you think that's likely, Talia? Yeah, I think it's likely. And also, like, I will say that while I know that Doctor Who is like, you know, is like a staple of, of Britain at the same time, um, I think that it should be a more global show. I feel That's like great. it makes more sense for me for if like this like age, this like timeless, ageless character who travels all over the universe it seems it just it seems a little bit unlikely to me that he would just always be going back to the same little island <laughs> it's a fine balance isn't it because i know that a lot of people overseas one of the things that they gravitate towards the show for is because it doesn't look like everything else the locations mm. tend to be tend to look like like britain and it's got a different so but i think you've got you you've got a duty to maintain that continuity we were talking about and the look of that show so eating out in places such as this with with um, with millie and and uh Gemma there so you've got a duty to do that in the same way that you have mm -hmm. on on detective shows and things like that but also to expand it to and to be and to be as wild as you as you possibly can and to think big and I, I yeah I think yeah. that could be that could be coming that a, a finer balance could be on the way yeah, yeah. and, and, and also I, so I know I was gonna say and also if like the doctor did ever come to the US like I would not like I would hope 
that they would come to Cambridge. And I would not be surprised. <laughs> no, like I said, I live like um I live oh. like really close to Harvard Square, actually. Like mm -hmm. I actually used to like I did like a temp job at Harvard and I could like and my old apartment I could like walk there and I walk to work every day. So I'm saying like um like I live in an area that's like very um culturally well known. Um so I'm saying that like or even like the um like in like there's been like recent Marvel projects that have filmed like at MIT. Um oh, in course. Yeah, and so like I, I just mean you know it it makes um it makes sense to me, and I would hope that at some point the doctor would come to my area. But also, I've but been for I've years. Got a story though, Talia, because what yeah. could happen? He could have the same problem as as you get with people who are phoning your place of work. He could <laughs> believe that he's going to one Cambridge <laughs> and end up in another. <laughs> And that could be the start of a little Yeah, crazy. no, he could he could think he's going to one Cambridge and then whoops, now you're in Massachusetts. Um I've gone. but I've been but it's kind of funny. I've also been considering for a long time considering moving to Wales. Um but uh the like immigration have you ever been process. Very is drastic? Very cool. you? <laughs> well, no, okay. So the thing is I have loved um Wales since I was very young. Um, Beautiful place. Uh, also, I've Most never been there, but I've like, but like I've I've been. So one of the things is I really love. Um, I have a really strong love for mythology and folklore, and I specifically I remember when I was in high school, I took a class actually at Harvard. Um, uh, they they have Harvard Extension. High schoolers can take anyone can take those classes, including high schoolers. Um, and so I took a Harvard Extension course on Celtic mythology, and I just really, um, I really loved Welsh mythology. Also, um, a lot of, so like my mother's, um, my mother's family is majority like uh, from like the, uh, like, she, well, so on my grandmother's side, like everyone's been in the U.S. since like the original colonization, <laughs> but on my granddad's side, um, uh, it's uh, like, I think my great grandfather actually um, uh, 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 immigrated from, uh, from the UK and then like his, um, and then like his mother, like they came from, they came through Canada, but also like fairly recently, um, from the UK. I've, I've done a lot of like genealogy work and I just, um, yeah. And so the majority of my, like when I like did the ancestry.com and it like yeah. broke it down, um, actually the number one was actually Scottish and then Nigerian. And then it like went, uh, and then it went down, but like most of my, um, most of my family, it seems came from, uh, either, um, countries in Africa or, um, various places in the UK. Um, so that's letting stuff when you get into it, you get stuck into it. You open up a whole uh, whole minefield, don't you, of uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of um, possibilities and, and what do they call it strings, strains to to mm -hmm. where we where we uh, where we're tied to and people that we're tied to. Yeah, I've been tempted mm -hmm. to do that myself. I yeah, I think that's the old girl starting up and calling time on this edition of the show. I'll be back with another one pretty soon. Look out for that wherever you found this. And uh, let, let's give people a nice big plug for, for your show too. So this is the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast. You've either just launched or you, you're about yeah, to so launch that's, season Yeah, so that's three. the graphic for our teaser trailer. We just launched um, season three with The Runaway Bride. Mm -hmm. um, so we just started that. Um, and then we are... Um, if, if this is releasing two yeah. weeks from now, our first episode of season three will have come out, which is yes. Smith and Jones. Yeah, which is Smith and exciting. Jones will have will have just come out, and we'll One of have my favorite episodes. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, you might not like our episode on it then. Um, no, it's just, it's, 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 I like no. you. Don't say that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that we dislike Smith and Jones. It's that Smith and Jones has. <laughs> like when you think about the implications of the fact that like almost everyone in that hospital is dead but don't say things like no 
No, I'm, oh, I'm going to have to listen to oh, it now. Oh, we've got, a very, we've got a very large science section in our show. So yeah, we'd love yeah, to hear you. Where can people hear you, Lucia? Where, <laughs> where can people find your podcast? You've got a home, have you got a home feed and which podcatchers are you on? Yeah, so oh. we, you can actually find us um, our, on our website is wibblywobblytummywimey.net or wibblypod.com. Either URL works. Um, and then all of our social media is at wibblypod. Um, so we've got Instagram, we've got, uh, we don't really use our Facebook or TikTok, but we've, uh, we've got Twitter. Um, we've got, uh, YouTube that is not fully updated with all of our episodes. Um, but, but we Tumblr, do have, I had. <laughs> we have the Tumblr, which Lisha does. Um, so I and our social media manager, Charlie manage, um, all the rest of them. Um, but you can find us basically, um, basically almost everywhere that there's podcasts, uh, you can you can find us. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're we're everywhere. We have um, but yeah, just go to um, go to our website uh, wibblypod.com/slash/listen, and you'll find all of the places where you can listen to us. Um, and then we also have transcripts for all of our episodes um, because we believe and we fully believe that accessibility is really important so if you go to our website um wibblypod.com you can find all of our transcripts and each transcript actually has the audio of the episode embedded into the page um so if you don't want to listen on your regular podcatcher and you just want to and you want to listen while reading the transcript you can go to our website we also have a patreon which is patreon.com slash wibblypod um we're just Wibbly Pod pretty much everywhere. <laughs> There's no no Cause... fat on that is the Wibbly Pod. It's it's boils it down. It's a very yeah. distinctive, yeah. very distinctive name. I can see why you stuck with it, Lucia. Yeah. Well, I was amazed. I remember being amazed that it wasn't taken when I first when I felt <laughs> like that the Wibbly Wobbly Time Away podcast was something that no one else had sort of claimed yet. Um so I'm very proud that I managed to grab it while I could. <laughs> yeah. And I um like I said, I joined a little bit later but um when i joined i kind of uh went a little um went, like the the branding sort of completely changed <laughs> like we have a completely different logo so i designed the lo our logo myself um and then i have um and then like yeah. i said i was doing most of the social media myself uh for um yeah. for a while until i turned over to um now we have a social media manager and charlie and they're great yeah, but yeah, so all of our graphics have been done by Talia, and they're all amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I. Just, you work together this, to create. This podcast create is basically my life. Friend. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, what it is is I'm I'm the executive producer of the podcast, um, mm -hmm. where Lucia is the audio engineer. So we're both co-hosts. We both talk on the podcast, but I basically cover. I have my hands in like everything so i do social media i do editing i do like scheduling all that stuff whereas lucia mostly focuses on uh editing and making like the final draft of the of the episodes and making sure that I they see. sound nice whereas i do like the rough cuts and then we also have an editor d who helps us with the rough cuts as well um but uh, and Lucia manages the Tumblr as well because I <laughs> uh, Tumblr isn't really my thing. Um, I haven't uh, like I have a Tumblr, but I haven't really been on it since I was like uh, probably in like uh, like late high school, early college was the last time I was active on Tumblr. Back when I'm Super Who Lock was a thing. Oh, Super Who Lock. Well, that's a conversation I for remember. another time. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. It's been delightful to spend this time getting to know you two and uh, hearing about your, your show and your friendship and, and Doctor Who from that international perspective as well across all those different time zones, which are, I believe, essential to the show moving forward. Mm -hmm. Britishness, obviously, is a key component of Doctor Who. But the expansion of its appeal, I think it's difficult to orchestrate something something like that. I, sometimes mm -hmm. I think when people try too hard to do it, it really shows and it can mm -hmm. sometimes fail because of that. But uh, I believe that the bright talent is on screen and behind the scenes to, to make it really happen this time. And, and for mm -hmm. Doctor Who, for its 60th anniversary moving forward, to uh, to really begin not start over as such but to certainly go 
next level. I'll certainly be listening to to what you both have to say about everything that's coming later this year and next year too. I'm excited that you're both so excited. And yeah, once again, thanks for spending time with me talking through some of these, some of these topics this time. I hope to bring you back at some point in the future. If you're down for that, I'd be very interested to hear what you've got to say, particularly when you, when you discover more classic Doctor Who there, Talia, and, uh, and when you've had more time to process, perhaps, Lucia, about the changes that are, that are coming <laughs> coming for the show, we'll, we'll connect again. But for the moment, yeah, I mean, happy happy 60th anniversary to the both of you. And uh, yeah, let's hope it works out a good one for all of us. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show. Our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU Podcast discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. We've teased and tantalized you there, and we can even clothe you too. There's merch to match all of those shows, including Type 40. If you head over to tpublic.com, search for the Fandom Podcast Network, and that's where you'll find a store full of all the team colors for all of the shows on everything from T-shirts to mugs, phone cases, and tapestries. Seeing is believing. Treat yourself, treat your other selves, and it all goes to support the Fandom Podcast Network into the bargain. So everybody wins you can you can find the links to all of that in the show notes as always and the description to the video track to every edition of type 40 a doctor who podcast now comes not only in the standard audio version that we've always put out but with raw ish video editions too over on youtube on the space book channel that's the old girl starting up and calling time on this edition of the show. I'll be back with another one soon. Look out for that wherever you found this. It could have been on the dedicated home feed for Type 40 at type40.podbean.com. Could be we rolled up on the podcatcher of your choice. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Google Play, Amazon Music, Podbean, all those places. And we're on the Podbean app itself. Of course we are. We're on YouTube, the world's largest streaming platform here on the Spacebook channel. Plus, we're still on the fabulous Fandom Podcast Network's own master feed, loaded up with so many treats for your ears, never mind on the weekly. They're coming at you with it on the daily. So consider a trip sideways in time to the Fandom Podcast Network. Maybe you'd like to have your say about all of this and everything that's to come in the near future on Doctor Who. You can reach out to us through our social media, Instagram and Twitter at type 40 Doctor Who. Or if you're feeling really brave, you can join us in the Type 40 Facebook group. Just go over to Facebook. That's still the biggest of the social media platforms. So go to Facebook, type Type 40 into the search field, and soon you'll see the Type 40 Facebook groups pop up. 
full of regenerations upon regenerations worth of Doctor Who fans talking about the classic series of Doctor Who, celebrating new Doctor Who too, and anticipating all new Doctor Who with Shuti Gatwa and Millie Gibson to come from Christmas 2023. That's another one wrapped up, I think. What's to come next? That's for me to know and you to find out. Lots recorded, lots of exciting interviews, previews, geek outs and deep dives coming your way, all to mark the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who, as eclectic and as fun as ever. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so over on Twitter and Instagram as The Space Book, where I'm wheezing and groaning, ranting and raving about all things geeky inside and outside of the TARDIS with the odd bit of real life thrown in now and again when I absolutely have to. Again, my thanks to the wibbly wobbly timey wimeys, Lucia and Talia. Go and check them out. Go and find their podcast and their website and everything else. You'll find links to that in the description too. And as always, my thanks to you for listening. We always have the time. If you have the space here at Type 40, but that's it for this time. You take care. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.